So good morning, everybody. Yes, it's been about three years since I visited uh, with uh, you at the symposium, and we've learned a tremendous amount. I am not a rabbit expert. Please know that. In fact, uh, uh, you know, they, uh, they are a favorite, but maybe not the most favorite I, I work with. However, there's an unmet need with housing rabbits. And working with ALAC, especially, and looking at the new guide, we're struggling. And having seen many institutions since I visited you last try to work out how to best meet the social needs of rabbits um, has been uh, problematic. And so really, the previous speaker, Brian, really touches on something that I'll mention in a few slides. It's the natural history of the animal, looking at the ecosystem adaptation of the animals we work with. And honoring that, we need to be aware of how they behave in the wild. In spite of 600 plus years of domestication of the rabbit, and the New Zealand white rabbit, even much more recent than that, they still retain a lot of the behavioral attributes of their wild counterparts, the European uh, rabbit. And so uh, what we've learned uh, since uh, three years ago is let's key in on those traits, let's honor those, let's recognize our constraints, and let's make the most of rabbit welfare in our research environment. So I'm beginning with the end. Let's begin with the end and get right back to the end as soon as we can. This is my philosophy, social housing rabbits. And it's based on my experience at the university and it's based on science. It's based on evidence, it's based on data. You know, we live in a world now of alternative truth, let's say. And we need to really have facts and data drive our decision making. And we need to publish more, and that was one of the challenges I posed to all of you three years ago. And some of us have, and I've really rallied our troops at the University of Rochester to publish as much as they can where possible when we have animals that come in where we can invite them to be research subjects. So here we go. New Zealand white male rabbits, less than 12 weeks of age, and females, these are guidelines, are generally compatible. They do, they do well. For us, intact adult males, greater than 12 weeks old, not so well. They progressively become more aggressive and wound each other. And if you have firsthand working experience with rabbits in social settings, you'll know that. You'll see that. We need to really rely on our experience. And if our experience shows otherwise in some situations, we need to publish that. We really do. Because our little program in Rochester has really relatively few rabbits. And we have these brave researchers that invite us to collaborate to help them help us figure out the best way to house rabbits. And so they're collaborators all the way, just like when we started with primates. You know, Kate Baker came to our institution when we were social housing primates, and you know, those are the days when we'd hold our breath, pull the divider, and pray. <laughs> We've come a long way, right? And the same is true for rabbits, where we can really learn how science can drive our decision making. Now, here's what some, this is what surprised us at our institution, because female rabbits are generally considered to be more compatible than males uh, across ages, let's say. And we went into a study, which I'll mention briefly, at, our, at Rochester, where we learned otherwise, and it was a real surprise to us. And so our, our philosophy is females greater than 12 weeks old, they're social for sure, but they naturally demonstrate wounding behavior. And a lot of it is, is situational, depending on how we can meet their needs as they are met in the wild. But we have seen that that is a problem, and it's a welfare problem, and even a staff morale problem. And we really need to factor that in as well. And we do have situations where we believe there is a mutual tolerance that's possible, especially with females, adult females. And I've heard scenarios of that, especially in polyclonal antibody-producing rabbits that are together for years. We need to publish on that. 
So these are the conclusions, and how did we arrive at these conclusions? Um, I will make available this whole sh this whole program as a PDF for anybody who would like it, because there are a tremendous number of references here that you'll find really useful, I think, as you critically evaluate your, your own program. Because when I wear my ALAC hat, when I'm going to visit institutions, uh, gone are the days where we have an entrance briefing where we go page by page, and we look at your program description, and we want to know why that air gradient is positive and why that uh, protocol is missing a signature. Those days are gone. Uh, when um, I'm doing ALAC entrance briefings, and I think some of you have enjoyed some of them with me, when I'm doing ALAC entrance briefings, I close the program description and I'll ask, what is your philosophy on social housing animals? What is your philosophy? And hopefully someone won't stare at their shoes and not have more information than just meeting the minimum requirements or not knowing how to approach social housing, fill in the blank, whatever it is. So we really need to have um, rationale on why we social house certain animals certain ways. And I'll focus on rabbits for the next few minutes. We're promoting animal welfare. That's one of our big uh, mantras, really, for ALAC and all of what we do. We promote good science. We promote animal welfare. They go hand in hand. You know, we've um, tried to figure out what animal welfare really is. Uh, this is a very simple definition, that it's their quality of life, and it's measured on a continuum. Uh, it changes throughout their life and how we manage them. So a continuum of poor to good. You may be familiar with the five freedoms. Uh, the Farm Animal Welfare Council uh, really promoted these. Um, I think they're kind of negative. Uh, I work in a zoo as well as a research facility, and I do a lot of wildlife work, and I love the idea of, um, of inviting sanctuaries to participate in uh, good science. Um, I work in a really wonderful sanctuary in Borneo with orangutans that are just like you described with uh, being um, orphaned. Anyway, I think these are kind of negative. Uh, freedom from hunger and thirst. Freedom from inadequate environment. Freedom from pain, injuries, and distress. Freedom from fear. Freedom from impossibility of expressing normal, normal, normal behavioral repertoire. These are kind of negative. So what are we doing, at least in the zoo world? And you know, zoos like, like research facilities are under the microscope about uh, welfare and also, in many ways, our relevance. I was talking to a, um, a, a future, Winnie, who's speaking later, about a new facility she's building in New York City where a big component of it is a visitor experience. And it's outreach with community and it's translational science and research. So here's what zoos are doing. We're looking at five opportunities instead of five freedoms. And the five opportunities are to thrive with these following examples. Natural feeding responses and behaviors. Again, how are these animals hardwired in the wild? Let's promote some natural behaviors. Let's give choice and control. Now, this might not be feasible in every situation we have, but we found even working with primates in a research facility, if they have control and choice or even participating in their research protocol, they'll work more. You don't have to pull a, rab a monkey, a primate from a cage to a lab if they can get the job done in their home setting. So choice and control, good physical health, obviously, and we want to promote natural behavior. But that means you have to know what the natural behavior is. So really do your homework on whatever species you have. Be they naked mole rats, uh, be they zebra finches, be they rattlesnakes. I did an accreditation site visit at a rattlesnake facility, and my top question when I went into the rattlesnake facility is, why are they all single housed? They never have, no one's ever asked them that. Rattlesnakes are social. They are. They climb over each other. They nest with each other. And so really we need to do our homework with the species that we are working with, whatever, under whatever circumstances. If it's the meat industry, if it's research, if it's a zoo. And we want healthy stress responses. If you're a bonobo, we know what that means. God bless them. And we want to avoid chronic stress and distress especially. Uh, the last one of uh, these conferences I went to, uh, Bernie Rollins was doing a presentation, and I learned a new word. And there are two ways to pronounce it, 
Telos and Telos. And it's from the time of Aristotle. It's a branch of philosophy. Telos is the root term for teleology, the study of purpose. The study of purpose. What is an animal's purpose in the wild? What, how is it hardwired for success? How does it function? How, what is this ecosystem adaptation? Fish has got to swim, birds got to fly, right? And we have, to re, we have to remember that when we're housing them in a, in a research setting. So what are their species-specific natural behaviors? Are they gregarious? What does that mean? Are they social? What does that mean? You know, even the guide says social species by default should be housed socially. Well, there's a lot more to it than just trying to interpret that one sentence. And it really, you need to honor all species, whatever you're working with. We do have some guidance, and ALAC uses these as a set of reference resources, and we uh, all know them well if we work at, um, in the United States or with an ALAC accredited institution internationally. And remember, we need to stay current with the literature, and we need to contribute to the literature. And I'll uh, mention some considerations at the very end. Just to remind you, this is sort of the ho-hum stuff, but we have to know about it. And I love USDA and AWIC, so. <laughs> but we have to live with it, and we honor that as well. But did you all know that under this section for rabbits, they have a statement about social housing? Actually, it's more of a, of a, of a, a qualification for social housing in red, that if you're going to do it, they need to be in compatible groups. What does that mean? Well, let's look it up. Compatible, able to exist or occur together without problems or conflict. Well, there's some subjecti subjectivity there, too, trying to interpret that. But USDA even wants us to look at compatibility. And they, they really look to us to make that happen, knowing the natural history of the animals we work with. We'll just focus on some of the red words, not, not all this. And again, all of these slides will be available to you. But when you're developing your social housing policy, think about these, especially if you have some exceptions or some twists and turns in the road. But the ILAR guide uh, suggests that you need to pay attention to, again, how these animals are hardwired. Are they naturally territorial? Are they communal? Should they be single? Should they be in pairs? Should they be in groups? Like tigers, for example, are very social up to a point. And then in nature, they're, they're solitary. And they don't get along with free contact, even sisters. And you need to know that. And then you need to know how to give them the best experience without getting on other tigers is protected contact. And they lay next to each other, and they, they interact. But boy, the free contact is a bit of a showstopper. So know the species' typical natural social behavior, and there's your key to success. So when you're developing your social housing policy and your enrichment policy, drill down on those so that when someone like me or someone from ALAC asks you, there's your focus. We know, like with tigers and situationally with rabbits, that they're not necessarily socially compatible at all times. And that if they aren't, if we try to force that, we are going to have some, let's say, unhappy. I like that word. <laughs> not everyone does. But let's say we're having animals that might experience distress or chronic stress. And those animals don't make good animal models for translational research. They just don't. And we know that. That's obvious. And we need to know the details. Now, the guide actually calls out a few animals. And I bet some of you may say, uh, not for me. You know, maybe you're housing uh, male mice together, breeder mice. I've heard of some strategies that do that. Uh, maybe female hamsters uh, are um, workable for you in your lab in ways that you can manage them. But even the guide specifies some examples of animals that are not necessarily socially compatible. And with rabbits in particular, and they don't mention rabbits, but this is true for rabbits, that they develop and they maintain a hierarchy. And how do you do that? Well, oftentimes, you will do it with aggressive behavior. Not if you're a bonobo. <laughs> but that's unusual. So rabbits uh, may demonstrate aggressive behavior as they're maintaining or for sure establishing hierarchies in uh, the wild as well as in 
uh, a captive setting. And we know that if we are uh, unable to social house animals, there are important opportunities to optimize enrichment, optimize enrichment and, and look for consequences of that effort. Uh, we are harmonizing standards internationally. So the Europeans um, have in ETS 123 in Appendix A comment on rabbits specifically. They uh, suggest that they're gregarious naturally. They suggest that young and female rabbits are harmonious in social groups. What's gregarious mean? Sounds like a good word. Well, it means it's just, just they tend to live in groups. And some of the publications I'll briefly mention in a few minutes show that what we know, some of those groups are over 100 acres. It's like stallions. If you work in a land-grant institution, you're working with stallions, they're fine on 100 acres, but not in the same paddock. And, uh, you know, lessons learned. So they suggest in ETS-123 that intact male rabbits um, shouldn't be housed with other intact males. Uh, that we can enhance their environment, uh, and that young rabbits and adult females are usually okay in groups. You just have to monitor them. And I think anecdotally, most of us have done that, and going through site visits of institutions, I see people who have success stories, and just with primates, we, you know, you heard the nightmare stories, and people are afraid to social house primates, and, and the brave and the bold scientists and behaviorists helped us see other ways. And we've been trying with rabbits, but we need more help if there is a way uh, to move forward. What is harmonious? That was in the previous slide, that these um, so success with social housing are for harmonious situations. That's where they're not experiencing disagreement or fighting. So they're not experiencing injuries, let's say. If you go to the ALAC website, and I'll focus on this more when we have our ALAC uh, piece later. Uh, we have a lot of guidance for institutions. We have an FAQ on social housing. And we, um, uh, of course, just really parallel what the guide expects with social housing and social animals being in stable groups. Uh, we um, are uh, expanding this FAQ. Uh, stay tuned. Uh, we're meeting in May, and we're enhancing this a bit uh, based on some of our um, under, better understanding, specifically with rabbits. Uh, so stay tuned on our FAQ. Social incompatibility keeps surfacing in FAQs and also alternatives. We also need to be sensitive to our staff. I think, uh, you know, we promote uh, animal welfare reporting and, you know, ask our staff when we're, wa when we're wandering through our facilities, what would you do if you had an animal welfare concern? Who would you contact? And many of them know the signs are up and they can contact an IACUC member or a vet. Uh, or their supervisor, uh, and they are our front line, and they are the best measure of uh, at least looking for uh, indicators of poor welfare and good welfare. And if they're, if they're interpreting bad welfare, uh, we need to have that conversation. And we've had that with our rabbit, our attempts at social housing rabbits, as I'll show you, haven't gone well. And we've really paid attention to some of the institutions that have promoted success to some degree. And we need to factor in uh, our, our, our staff as it relates to how they interpret what we're doing and understand our roles. We have an ALAC position statement. That will not change. It's really solid. Um, it, it, it covers all the animals that we would be concerned about and all of the considerations, as we know, social incompatibility, veterinary concerns, scientific justification for not social housing, at least social species by default. So simply stated, we have three basic opportunities that need to be justified for single housing social species, incompatibility, vet reasons, and scientific necessity. Nothing new. Well, I did find some new literature uh, to share with you. So much of what we know about rabbit welfare is in the meat industry. Let's not bruise the meat, right? Let's minimize mortality. We won't eliminate it. We'll just minimize it. But, you know, it's about the meat and the welfare. And there's been an incredible um, amount of attention in Europe on the welfare of meat-producing rabbits, such that most of the social housing studies have been done with the production programming in Europe. 
So this book is, is, uh, is loaded, it's the recent advances in rabbit science. It's, 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 a, it's a, on the web, it's free. And they um, have their welfare indicators from uh, behaviorists and biologists and scientists, uh, you know, hoping for, planning for at least low, unavoidable mortality. You know, there is mortality with everything we do. And with the rabbit meat production, showing, I'll show you in a sec how they're housed, there is um, anticipated some mortality as well as morbidity. We can look at uh, physiologic uh, metrics on welfare. Uh, it's uh, not easy, but we could look at cortisol levels, and uh, there's not much out there really. And uh, behavior is a really easy opportunity for us to generate ethograms. And then, of course, with the uh, meat production, it's all about the meat, the color of the meat, the flavor of the meat. Uh, it's all about that product weight gain. So they've actually cut off their, their, their uh, they call it the fattening period, where they're fattening these New Zealand white bunnies to be delicious. And they are delicious. If you haven't had one, I encourage you. They're awesome. But they cut off that fattening period because they want to maximize the meat and minimize the, the loss focusing on welfare is too. So but one chapter in there is about the behavior of growing rabbits, which is really mostly what I think we work with with young research rabbits. Um, not many of us keep rabbits around for long periods. If we do, please publish some of your amazing experiences. But what they find is that aggression, aggression increases with age. We know that if you've ever worked with uh, rabbits. You know, around 11 to 12 weeks of age is when it's at its highest. Think about how old your rabbits are when you get them in. Pinned rabbits in same-sex groups, again, the same trend. Uh, I will comment on density of animal housing in a, in a, in a minute as well. Uh, but it increases with age, and there's a window where aggression is observed and documented. And with our publications we've just released from our program, these trends are paralleled in beautiful large pens, social housed with all the bedding and all of the wonderful housing opportunities and shelving. We're seeing these same trends in our studies and we're, I was uh, maybe naively surprised. So this is uh, one of our first studies and it's out and it was in JAWS in 2017. We have an amazing team. Louis De Vincenti is one of our veterinarians. Some of you may know him. Angelica Rarig is, a, is our behaviorist. I hired her from the zoo. She had no idea what monkeys with head implants were, uh, or eye coils, or water restriction, or all that stuff. And she has really, I think Molly said at one meeting I was at, we need to bring the zooey part to science and the science part to the zoos. We need to cross-fertilize, we really do. So Angelica and Lewis and the team uh, asked questions about male rabbits, and uh, male rabbits in various scenarios. And we really only used rabbits that were acquired for research purposes. We don't have our own reason for acquiring these rabbits. So there were 16-week-old male rabbits, and uh, that's getting up there, but they you know, were young looking. And we house them in different ways, in pens, in cages, single, in cages, uh, double wide. And we found you know, aggression was pretty consistently uh, the, the observation. We found them when we, and these were not litter mates, but they were shipped together in uh, the same crate. We found that when we put them in uh, pairs and cages, they fought day one such that our staff was really worried about them and their welfare. We found that in a pen, it uh, took a while for us to uh, have them reach an endpoint where the injuries were such that we felt we needed to separate them. And we had a similar trend when we started in a pen and then moved them into a cage, thinking maybe they'll go through an acclimation period, get to know each other. Uh, we had some uh, successes over short periods of time, and then the study ended because we, the researcher needed the rabbits. So we don't have long-term experience, but it's over a long enough period of time that it's actually tangible to us as far as housing them in a research setting. And these are the examples of exploratory behavior, affiliative, and agonistic that you've all probably seen in rabbits. This is um, a repurposed dog run that we house the rabbits in. These are the males, looking pretty good in the beginning. We did also the side-by-side -side cages with the tube in the middle. Um, and we, um, we generally, over time, had um, 
problems and challenges with their welfare and injuries. And, uh, you know, if you're taking care of these rabbits and that's what you see, uh, it's, it's not a good experience. You know, there's all, there, you know, there's a dominant one and a submissive one. The submissive one's in the corner, and there's hair plucking, and it persists. It'd be different if it was episodic or just once, but it persists, at least in our experience, with, these, with, the, with the, the caging that we have. So we really, when we launch these behavioral studies in rabbits, we work closely with our staff because we want them to help us uh, measure success. We want to succeed, and we want to promote welfare. This is another one just got accepted um, to comparative medicine, and it'll be out, but it's the female part of that, that question. And we uh, work with the CRO, Contract Research Organization, and we, uh, we, same sort of story, we had paired rabbits and pen-housed rabbits, lots of space for them uh, in the pen especially. They were young, uh, 12 or 11 weeks old, uh, you know, lightweight, and we uh, were pre feeling pretty good. We didn't want to handle the rabbits much. We just sort of observed them and fed them and cleaned them. And during the day, which we, was the only time we observed them, shame on us, because if you know rabbit behavior in the wild, they spend all their time being busy at night and at sunset and sunrise. Uh, and so we were feeling pretty good. We'd see the rearing up and the hopping and the chasing, and it all looked well and good uh, for even the paired rabbits until we clipped their fur for a dermal toxicology study. And we had to disqualify all of them. They all had skin injuries that were granulating in. They were like these linear incisions. I'll show you a picture. I, was, I visited a vendor uh, recently, and we are all asking our vendors to pair house, many of us are, pair house rabbits before they visit us. Well, what they're seeing, some of them are seeing anyway, is that when the rabbits arrive at the, the institution, they get rejected because they have wounding, skin wounding injuries. And so just go into it knowing that that might be all right. It's, they're minor. They are, though, uh, they break the skin, they go into the subcutaneous tissue, they're healing, they're inflamed, and uh, they, may, they may pose some challenges to replicating work, especially if the other rabbits you work with don't have those skin injuries. And uh, there, are, there is a definitely benefit of pen housing and social housing rabbits. In fact, the pen housed rabbits spend a lot more time doing their normal behaviors. But part of that pie wedge, which we didn't characterize, is aggression and incompatibility. That's how they're hardwired. That's how they maintain their hierarchies. So these are our pen rabbits. Looks pretty fun, right? We, I mean, really? Gosh, how, how great was it to develop this and to give all the treats and the, and the shelters and the, and the ledges and and uh, the hay and, and uh, how much fun taking photographs and oh my god, it just, it, our morale shot straight up. And we just so much enjoyed doing this. And so did the bunnies, it seemed, you know? How great choices they had. And uh, they, uh, they actually were easier for us if we did kneel down, they'd come up to us. They, they were friendlier, less fearful. They had choices as well, and they had lots of choices for food and water, and all of the materials and methods describes all the ins and outs of how we uh, manage this. But that's what we found when we clipped the fur on all of them, not just one. And they had these healing injuries uh, through various stages, and you know, looking at some publications on skin healing in rabbits, and there's a lot out there, uh, these, were, these could have been anywhere from 28, up to 28 days old. We just missed it. So it really was, these are, these, it's, it's occult aggression. We didn't see it happen. Had, if we had it to do over again, we definitely would be videotaping at night. So they were disqualified and uh, moved into some other terminal studies. And uh, uh, in our particular protocol with this research facility, uh, we recognize this as a risk. And for at least the scientific questions posed, it's a showstopper. We cannot do dermal studies with animals with injured, injured skin. Uh, and we, though, need to risk assess if there is a way to recognize that as a step in a process that might naturally end up in uh, uh, mutual tolerance. But for us, rabbits of this age, even females, uh, pose this risk of injuries. Getting a little reality check on space requirements, because a lot, a lot of 
the compatibility is correlated with space available and uh, hiding space and you know lots of other enrichment options, but space is a big deal. Now for the meat industry, it's all about the meat and the turnaround during the fattening period and to make the best meat product possible. And so that bottom, uh, so they're on the fattening phase of the meat industry, that's, that's uh, square foot per rabbit. It's, they're crammed in. And so that really could contribute to some of these trends in morbidity and mortality that the meat industry describes. But with our limited publications, we, again, we are seeing a similar pattern with uh, at least our bottom two, our bottom two, you can see how much, how much space each one of those rabbits had. The cage is pretty much your typical rabbit cage, but it was double wide. And our pen was half a room. And we only had six rabbits in that pen. And we were seeing similar patterns. And you can see what the EU directive and what the guide in USDA requires for rabbits that are, that are about that right size. So for us, providing more space in a highly enriched environment didn't necessarily uh, help us. Uh, this is uh, typical for a uh, production facility. Uh, and they are trying to promote welfare as it relates to substrates, hay, uh, gnawing sticks. They've really been able to look even under these dense housing settings uh, at enrichment that will, pr that will promote welfare and promote a good meaty product. We have more references on the way. I mentioned the FAQ on ALAC. Stay tuned for the summer. Uh, there's a new book coming out, uh, the second edition of the Management of Animal Care and Use Programs and Research. Um, there's a chapter in there that um, describes dogs, cats, primates, rabbits, and uh, many other species. So stay tuned for that. And it also focuses a little bit on the natural history and the ecosystem adaptations of these animals, you know, whatever they are, be they a primate or a rabbit, and why that's uh, so critical to honor when we're trying to promote the best program for, these, for our animals. Another publication that came out of our program is more of a review of the literature, and that's already out. That was in November of 2016, and it was the cover article of Jay last. Nice, beautiful rabbit on the front, if you all remember it. Yeah? We're very happy about that. Uh, and it was a review of the literature, and it really focuses on the species typical natural behavior and what's published out there, both in free ranging, in meat programming, and in research facilities. Not so much in research facilities, unfortunately. So some of the quick sound bites, and I'll zip through these because we're approaching coffee break too. And these are all in the references, uh, and they're also actually all of these are in the ALAC website uh, for reference resources. Uh, and so um, you have the information out there available to help you uh, have a rational science-based social housing program for sure for rabbits. Very large pasture area, almost two acres in Australia. Uh, in the blue, we saw severe, they saw severe fighting as dominance was established. And this is a large, large area. Mutual tolerance of certain rabbits and rabbits get chased off by their dads. Uh, a similar, the same author, uh, severe injuries uh, due to male on male and female on female aggression for burrow possession. Dominant bucks do their job, and uh, you might see less defense, defending burrows with breeding periods. Breeding periods and uh, none, our social pressures are absent in uh, summer, and they rest, play, and groom. We tried to change light cycles in our rabbit rooms to parallel the light cycle in happy Australian summers for these bunnies, and we just didn't see it, unfortunately. But we probably could have done a better job. And we recognize that uh, males are, in these publications, always fighting, and females might be okay at lower densities. And hay helps. Mutual tolerances, again, I think something uh, that many of you out there, if you have those polyclonal antibody-producing rabbits, have experienced, and, uh, and that's a win-win for sure, and uh, they have low rates of aggression. They still might have some surprises in your future, but it's, it's a low grade. Male-on-male -male aggression is, uh, as I've been mentioning, pretty much the same story. You'll see similar patterns. Now, here's, you know, here's the female-to-female -female aggression, and that's where... I think we have a lot to learn because I think there's hope. I don't think we need to always single house female rabbits, but I think uh, we need to learn more and we need to promote welfare and good science. And so female to female aggression was, you know, protecting burrows. Um, new females, of course, they have this periodic crankiness, it turns out. Uh, and boy, when they fight, they fight. Males, usually they'll just castrate each other, but the females will eviscerate each other. 
And so look out for that. And I did a survey of all ACLAM diplomates uh, about five years ago. And, you know, I got some of those testimonials like, we're never doing that again. And, you know, we've got to get over that, too, because there might be a better way to do it. Uh, and then once you're established, you might be okay with the females. And, of course, space helps. And, um, and estrus uh, is a real contributor to uh, uh, incompatibility in these females between, inter between females and also with uh, males getting um, interested. Young females will go out and form compatible groups. Okay, that's good. So we have young females that are compatible to a certain point. And breeding season is always uh, an issue. Sort of the same pattern, same story, so I, I won't go into it very far. But these are publications, many of them are from the 50s and 60s. You know, kind of shame on us for not going back that far in the literature. I mean, that's good science. It's awesome. And I had a heck of a time getting these publications from long ago. And I think we all too often um, have a, a, we don't look back far enough. And so please remember that. There's a lot to learn from past publications. And uh, again, more and more, and this is more into the meat industry. There's a reason they slaughter rabbits at 85 days. And again, it's to promote the best meat because of the injuries that they experience. And linear rank is what it's all about. I mean, this goes on and on, and I promise I'm wrapping up soon. Stereopathies have been well characterized in rabbits. We even saw it in our pen housed rabbits chewing on bars. But we saw more natural appearing behaviors. Rearing up is one of those big ones. We all were struggling with a 16 inch high cage. You know, is that high enough? I mean, uh, so does a rabbit touch its ears on the roof? Well, it depends what the rabbit's doing and how big the rabbit is. But of course they do. Do they have skin lesions? No, but are they going to? I don't know. What's our goal here? So, rearing up, though, is really awesome. So, some institutions have. Um, made exercise pens. So situationally, rabbits can rear up and, and, and demonstrate that natural behavior, maybe not in their home cage. Again, focusing on wild counterparts and more laboratory assessments on caged rabbits and welfare and psychological well-being. And again, benefits. We've got to focus on the benefits. We'd, I don't want to be real negative on this, because there are benefits of social housing, especially with um, stereotypic behavior. It just has to be the right situation. Uh, trying litter pans to try to use that as an olfactory uh, option, that is communication central for rabbits out in the field. They uh, use these latrine sites. And a female that is an estrus, uh, and everyone knows it from the latrine site, and it changes all their behavior. And it can be very distracting. You possibly heard about the study at UC Davis where they were spraying male urine on all the females in a pen. And it kept the calm, from what I gather. And it kept everyone under control in a manner that at least was promoting welfare. And we're almost done, guys. Uh, more of the meat industry, looking at high mortalities and injuries and minimizing those to get a better meat product. High degree, high percentages of wounding. You know, 100% of our rabbits uh, were wounded in our study, the females. It wasn't serious. It didn't require suturing. But the rabbits that were on the receiving end of the wounding, who knows what they were feeling like from just a stress, distress, coping behavior. So here's our, here are our considerations. You know, we need to always monitor harm and benefit in everything we do. And what is the risk we pose to the science and the risk we pose to the animals? We really need to factor in the science and the natural history of the animals and, uh, and come from a, um, a scientific background to make our decisions. We now know that there are situations where they're aggressive, they, there's conflict, that's normal behavior. It hasn't been bred out of them. And we, uh, it's up to us to figure out a way to manage that, or at least understand it and accept it and recognize the constraints of our program. We are not going to be able to put six rabbits on a, a 1.7 acre pasture, are we? So that works that way, but it's being realistic about how we can manage the best welfare possible. And again, I've seen places where they, you know, they'll put them out in exercise pens alone and they'll um, appear to be able to at least maintain uh, normal uh, motor, uh, motor skills. And then we've got the rabbits. So back to the end, back to the end. We're back, we're back. Uh, uh, our philosophy at the University of Rochester is based on everything I just covered. 
We're open to change. We're not, uh, we're open to change, but this is our starting point. Recognizing that male New Zealand white rabbits uh, greater than 12 weeks old are a problem in our hands. Uh, that um, any gender under 12 weeks old is generally okay in social housing, but watch out. Between 10 and 12 weeks old, you're going to start seeing some sexual maturation. The ovaries start maturing, sperm starts maturing even at 10 weeks old. And that females are, uh, are tricky, and they're naturally aggressive maintaining their hierarchies. But what IACUC's and researchers and managers have to consider is uh, is uh, the harm, the benefit of that social experience. And I, I suspect, and I, I, I have just a, a, a tiny inkling that this may be true based on some of our preliminary work. I suspect once these penhoused rabbits get over their hierarchy questioning of each other, that they, uh, if they appear compatible in the pen, that we may be better positioned for pairing them in cages. And some of our very limited data supports that we had six pair or three pairs. Uh, two out of the three pairs were fine for another month after they were pair housed in a cage, after they demonstrated compatibility in a pen. They were, they were injured. They had skin injuries. Uh, so we need to figure out the harm and the benefit of all that. So you're invited. I invite you all again. Help us get it right. Please help us get it right. If you're having uh, a different experience than some of us are, please help us get it right. Uh, sometimes rabbits have a negative, a negative uh, reputation. I found this when I was searching the internet. This is a software program for managing social networking on your computer. What is that all about? <laughs> I mean, really. It's managing Facebook and all of it. And what is that rabbit riding? So I guess it's a Facebook sign, right? It looks like a razor blade to me, yeah. <laughs> doesn't it? <laughs> so I mean, that's just my interpretation. <laughs> and look at those teeth in the eyes. All right. So it, this is what we this is what we want. Uh, we want a party. Uh, we want it in the right situation. Uh, but we need your peer-reviewed publications. We need science to drive our decision-making, and we need, we need to honor how these animals are hardwired uh, to succeed in the wild. So thank you all very much. I look forward to meeting you at the coffee break. <laughs>